¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes a todos. Ay, qué ganas de sentarme, la verdad. Eh, nada, un placer que encontraros eh, aquí, eh, encontrarnos otra vez con, con nuestro querido profesor, eh, doctor honoris causa, eh, Robin Warren, y con nuestro afamado eh, decano de la Facultad de Medicina, Fernando Caballero. Eh, la, idea de, la idea del encuentro de hoy es, eh, es que aprovechéis la oportunidad, ¿no? Es ese, ese, como decía el poeta Horacio, carpe diem, ¿no? pues aprovechar que, que un, un premio Nobel está con nosotros, que ha venido desde Australia, eh, pues para hacerle pues, las preguntas que, que creéis que, podréis hacer, que podríais hacerle un premio Nobel para que os sirvan de ayuda en vuestra carrera. ¿no? Tenemos alumnos eh, espartanos de primero, de segundo, de tercero, de cuarto, pues probablemente tengáis eh, inquietudes distintas. ¿no? Y, y sí que me gustaría pues, que... Como veis es algo bastante familiar, no vamos a poner aquí como Aznar y Bush y tal, los pies encima de la mesa, pero, pero va a ser lo más familiar posible, o sea que eh, aprovechar. Ya habéis visto cómo es, cómo es Robin estos días, la verdad es que cada vez que, cada vez que anda por, un poco por la avenida esta que tenemos en, la, en, la, en el campus, pues... Eh, eh, tardamos habitualmente media hora en recorrer unos 25 metros porque todo el mundo... Esta mañana me, me hizo bastante gracia la chiquita que está arriba en el carrito de los helados, este, en el edificio ahí, ¿no? <risa> eh, eh, habían dejado a Robin el, el, el taxi, lo había dejado en el E en vez de haberlo dejado en el H, que teníamos un, un tema, ¿no? En el H. El caso es que me llamó, oye, que estoy aquí y tal, que, digo, voy a buscarte. Fui a buscarle y entro y no le veo, ¿no? Y digo, ¿dónde está? ¿Dónde está? ¿Dónde está? ¿Dónde está? Y me dice la chiquita del, del carrito, dice, ¿a quién buscas? ¿A Robin? Digo, sí, sí, está allí, ¿no? Y, me, y ahí estaba Robin, ¿no? Efectivamente, digo, nada, me hizo bastante gracia, ¿no? Que en realidad a Robin ya lo conoce todo el mundo, incluso eh, personas que no son de medicina y, y casi que todo el mundo ha querido hacerse una foto con él, ¿no? Bueno, pues ahora ya no es un tema de hacerse una foto, que, que nos haremos fotos con él pues justo cuando, cuando terminemos. Eh, tendréis la oportunidad de guardar pues, ese recuerdo, pero el recuerdo yo creo que tenéis que guardar en realidad, y el que es imborrable, una foto al fin y al cabo pues, a veces se pierde, otras veces se deteriora, eh, pero este recuerdo, pues guardarlo en la retina. Y, y con lo cual interaccionad con él, ¿no? todo lo que podáis. El que quiera... Hombre, la idea es que el que, el que hable inglés razonablemente bien, que sois la mayoría de vosotros, pues que os dirijáis a él en su, en su lengua nativa, ¿no? Y si no, pues ya estamos aquí para, para traducir. El que quiera hacerlo en castellano, pues que lo haga en español y, y ya le traducimos a Robin, ¿no? O sea, que, que, que no sea por eso, ¿vale? Eh, sí, hay micrófonos de sala que de hecho son estos. ¿Os importa echar una manilla con, con esto para irlo pasando, vale? Venga, eh, Alberman y Ariana, gracias. Eh, eh, siéntate como ahí en el medio y, y vamos viendo, ¿no? yo, yo te voy diciendo. Bueno. We're almost ready to start, ¿ok, sir? We're ready to start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Muy bien, ¿alguien quiere romper el, romper el hielo? ¿Alguien quiere hacer una pregunta a, a nuestro Robin? ¿De interés? Fran, arriba. Espera, espera, espera. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, ¿Cuándo decidiste o cuánto te diste cuenta de que querías estudiar medicina? Gracias. Uh, the question is, uh, when did you decide to uh, to study medicine and to join the medical school? When the, I mean, what was the thing that you <coughs> that you truly realized? I think that this is the way I, I would like to spend the rest of my life being uh, a physician. <laughs> that sort of decision when you were young. I can't remember exactly when, but I was pretty young. Um, my mother's family were all doctors, and I was very friendly with some of them, and I. You know, I always wanted to be a doctor. So. Why did you want to, to be a doctor? What did you see that w uh, that you loved? <laughs> In order to say, well, you know, <laughs> well, this is something that these guys have just questioned themselves as well, and they they are. In fact, they are here. So, uh, is th was there any driver for you? Well, I guess when I was at secondary school, I used to read an awful lot of books about medicine and particularly medical history, mm -hmm. um, which I found very interesting. I would suggest that anyone here, it's not a bad idea to know all about the past. You know, my 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 eldest son is there, and 
uh, and he's not going to course uh, medicine at all. Uh, so th there is something wrong in the example that both my wife and myself we have provided him with, that he's not willing to. Uh, to go on medicine, but it <laughs> seems that your family, yes, it was a, a good example for you. Yeah. But no one pushed me. I just Nobody pushed you? Mm. No. Yeah. Okay, any other, any other question? Yes, Rico? William? Hi. Uh, I want to know how important is Dr. Marshall in your life or in your researchers, and how we can try to work as a team as, be as better. Thank you. <laughs> Did you get it? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was good. Guillermo, uh, Guillermo is. Uh, uh, the, the question was very well formulated. So it's, it's stop laughing, guys. <laughs> Uh, here we have a we have a point that you're, you're from Australia and you're uh, and he is from uh, from where from Valladolid, <laughs> so this is the, the main discrepancy. It's a, a very nice town in in Spain, and uh, but your English accent and so on is is quite different. So yeah. <laughs> he made a uh, he made a point about uh, how important was for you Barry Marshall uh, in uh, uh, in driving the, the discovery of uh, Eliquator pylori and uh, he made a, a second a second question within the same one as it is um, um, uh, what do you think about teamwork because of in your biography uh, it seems that you started working as pathologists that you guys pathologists they you are you quite used to to work on your own or let's say more yeah. in a lonely setting so is this jump from working in the lab uh, or uh, just driving with the, with a microscope and jumping into a, a quite different way of doing yeah. things? So it was a bari, which means teamwork in a pathologist. Yeah, I actually discovered the bacteria myself working as a pathologist um, and just looking at sections with that had the bacteria on them. So I, I saw them and followed that up and found them quite commonly and and linked them to gastritis. But I couldn't really do much more because I didn't see any, it, the patients themselves. I just saw little bits of them that were sent down to us to um, diagnose. So um, it wasn't until I met Barry Marshall, who was actually working as a clinician in the gastroenterology department, that we could actually widen the study further. And he was able to take biopsies from patients in gastroenterology, and he could see the patients. He knew what was wrong with them all. He could send biopsies down, and when we had a big study, he actually sent biopsies from all the patients down for culture, which hadn't been done before because no one wanted to culture them. They weren't inter interested, but for our study, Barry sent them all down for culture, uh, as well as sending specimens to me, of course. And uh, he also had all the clinical findings that I'd never had before. So uh, we were able, with that, to culture the bacteria and show that they were some, they were like Campylobacter as we thought they were, but eventually we decided they were too different and had to be a different genus. So we call them Helicobacter. Um, and um, we also were able to show that they were closely related to duodenal ulcers, which I wasn't able to do. It wasn't until I had Barry Marshall working in the clinical world and looking at the patients, and he could see which patients had ulcers and which didn't. And it turned out that all of the ones with duodenal ulcers had the infection. And uh, as someone else pointed out before, I, I'm not suggesting that every patient with, with helicobacter gets ulcers. Uh, only a small percentage of them do. But um, when you do, it's a really nasty disease. So there are an awful lot of people with helicobacter who probably will never have any symptoms of it but they've nevertheless got the infection in their stomachs and they will have some degree, some often mild, sometimes severe, but uh, however bad the, inf the inflammation is, the gastritis, it will stay the same throughout your life. So if you've got mild gastritis now, it'll stay, it usually s seems to stay the same. So it's presumably a relationship between the particular strain of bacteria that are there and and uh, how pathogenic they are, and the uh, 
presumably the patient as well and they stay the same so the gastritis stays the same so if you've got severe gastritis because you have a severe reaction to the bacteria you've got uh, you have a severe gastritis for the rest of your life things like that we couldn't find out until Barry Marsh was there to help me so it became a clinical pathological study which uh, gradually broadened and has broadened em enormously since but, but yes that's what um, Barry Marshall was able to do make it a I think if, if it was only me looking at these bacteria in the stomach I would have published my original findings that showed that these bacteria were there they were growing in the stomach uh, they seemed to be related to a particular type of gastritis and um, uh, a few other odds and ends that I could put in and people would have said, oh yes, it's interesting, and forgotten about it. <laughs> so no nothing much would have happened. But um, with the help of Barry Marshall, we were able to make it a bigger clinical pathological study showing that bacteria and ulcers were closely related, and probably the bacteria were causing the ulcers. Where is Marie? Uh, Marie, where are you? Is Marie here? Oh, she went. Uh, Ma Marie, you're she was over there. Yeah, she was there. <laughs> um, she speaks about Barry Marshall as, uh, or she describes him as uh, a quite funny guy, yeah. isn't it? Uh, did you did you have a very uh, a good times uh, just working with him? Or oh, I, I think we worked very well together. I'm a, I'm a bit of a um, what got the word for it, but uh, in, into myself sort of bloke, and he's an yeah uh, an outside outgoing bloke, you know. Yes, he does a lot of talking, and he did all our. Uh, uh, advertising and so on, spread the word around. Right now. Well, that's what he Are did. Also, yeah, okay. Mm. Well, I'm from Valladolid too. I'm sorry about my accent, but I would like to know uh, if... <laughs> <laughs> Rico, she's from Valladolid. <laughs> well, I would like to know, why did you choose pathology? Why, what? Why, why did you choose clinical pathology what as your reason? specialty? Um, that's an interesting story, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you that. Um, I didn't start off being a pathologist. I started off intending to try and do psychiatry when I you know, finished my intern year. And um, being a, a nice little boy who didn't sort of push things and do, always do the polite thing, uh, I looked through the uh, the journals and found all the interesting pathology, uh, sorry, psychiatry registrars that were available for the next year, and I applied for the one I thought looked best, <laughs> and I didn't get it. And then I had to race around to find something else to do, and the only thing available that I could find was a a, um, a senior registrar or senior resident in pathology, which suited me fine anyway. I really enjoyed pathology, so. So I, th right, well, I started doing that, and actually I found I really did enjoy it, so I kept on with it. Uh, why, why, where did you, did you ask that? <laughs> she says that, uh, well, she is asking that because of it is not uh, <coughs> a very, let's say, uh, Murray back popular. Oh, I'm sorry? No, he's back. Oh, yes, she's back. <laughs> Hello, I was asking for you. <laughs> And uh, 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 Iria is asking uh, about that clinical pathology is not a very, let's say, popular or fashionable uh, specialty within the, uh, the broad spectrum of all different specialties. It was a reason for, for asking that. Because what? of, I mean, uh, you were a very, uh, I mean, you were a, a, lonely, a lonely child. Uh, I mean, is there any correlation between uh, your, your days in your infancy and then just no. becoming a clinical pathology, just that, that you love, um, let's say, living on your own or um, or working on your own rather than uh, joining big groups and so on? Or is there any link with that? Could be, I don't know. I didn't have, I didn't really join big groups particularly and yeah. I wasn't much good at sport either. In my school that wasn't a good thing either. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a, the culture in my school was, you know, you had to be good at sport and I wasn't, so. <laughs> And the only sport that I really liked, I guess, was was cycling. And I used to cycle all around the hills around Adelaide, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed. It. And I cycle around on my own, you know. So I guess, yeah, I'm a bit of a loner. Did you uh, Did you also? Uh, I've read about you that uh, horse riding 
was also something that you that you no. love? No, 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 not at all. So it's just no. uh, cycling. Yep. Okay. Taking photographs while I was going. <laughs> we will. We will go on that just afterwards. Good evening, Mr. Warren. I'm going to try in English. Uh, my question is, what did you feel in Sweden when you received the Nobel Prize? Because how I can remember, uh, you were fighting against all the odds a few years. Um, sorry, what was <laughs> So the question is about the, the day in which you, uh, you went to the ceremony of the Nobel, the Nobel Prize in Stockholm. Mm. Um, just even before uh, uh, giving your speech, what were your feelings out there <laughs> at, at that precise there? Maybe he. Mm, I don't uh, know. Are, are, are you expecting of, on having an, uh, also or joining uh, Robin as a Nobel laureate in a few years, likely? So I think that he's he's willing to know what did you what did you feel in order to be prepared for that day, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> I just went along with everything. It was a wonderful ceremony and everything just kept going like this. You know, you caught up in a. It, it was it was a wonderful ceremony, but what am I supposed to say? What did I feel? <laughs> yes, what did you feel? Uh, did you feel uh, proud, or is it more a matter of well, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here? No, I thought I guess I felt proud. It was nice to be recognised. Uh huh. What do you think it's been the uh, the impact of of your discovery at the end? I mean, are, are you conscious of that? Well, I'm conscious that it's changed my life quite a lot. Your life, yeah. Yeah. But also many, many thousands of people's life, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't done oh, it. Oh, yes, I yeah. think so. Buenas tardes. A mí me gustaría saber si durante su carrera él fue un alumno brillante desde que empezó la carrera, o como algunos que suspendemos algunas asignaturas, a ver si podemos acceder al premio Nobel en un futuro o no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Virginia is asking about whether uh, you were a very brilliant medical student for a very beginning all, all over the years of medical school uh, so as there is a link between you being very brilliant and uh, uh, receiving this, uh, this award because of she is speaking about that well sometimes many of these medical students, they fail in many disciplines. So as if, okay, mm -hmm. if I fail, maybe I, I will never be a, a Nobel laureate at all. Or you were a, a, an average guy, or a super, hyper, mega, ultra, brilliant mm -hmm. guy. No, I was like some of the guys <coughs> that are, are there. I was a fairly average student. I think I got a credit one year, but otherwise I just, just, just passed. Average. <laughs> But you asked why I did pathology, well, actually doing medicine, I enjoyed it all. There, there really was no part of medicine that we did that I didn't enjoy doing, so, you know, I could have done anything, I guess. It ended up being pathology that I did, but, but I think you should do something you enjoy, and so if there's some part of medicine that you particularly enjoy, you should aim at doing that. Otherwise, uh, do what you like. Don't try and get stuck in something you don't want to do. Uh, within the medical school, and just uh, going beyond that, that, that point that Virginia made, uh, what were the disciplines within medical school that you loved the most over the, the years? Because, of me I mean, medical school in, in Australia, how many years is there? Six years. Six years as well. Well, it varies now, but it, it, it was six years then. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what were the, uh, the disciplines that you loved the most? Well, I guess, it's really, I like playing around with microscopes. I loved doing histology when, I, when you did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember drawing all sorts of pictures of the things I saw down the microscope, the tissues and so on that we mm -hmm. saw. Um, and same with pathology. So, you know, I, I think I actually ended up in the right place. Yeah, so you fell in but love absolutely with, with, yeah. with pathology from the very beginning. But I could have done any of these things. So Anything. Yeah. So you were very open-minded at the end of the day, or which yeah. is no clinical pathology, clinical pathology, clinical pathology. No, no, no. Not at all. I enjoyed doing it, but then I enjoyed doing lots of other things too. So. Uh, what would be the, the discipline that maybe or the specialty that you 
that you, let's say, loved in, in the second place. Okay, first clinical pathology, but then it was, uh, were you more a, a, a clinical, uh, clinical doctor or more a surgeon? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I probably would have liked fat playing around with surgery, I guess. Surgery? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Not bad. Que um, a mí me gustaría saber, a cambio de una investigación merecedora de, de un Nobel, ¿qué hay que dejar a un lado si es que hay que dejar algo en cuanto a vida personal y familiar? O sea, porque yo he visto, he trabajado con, con científicos como biotecnóloga y he visto que muchos pienso que dejan al lado gran parte de su vida personal y familiar. Entonces. Esta es una muy buena pregunta, en verdad. La pregunta es: ¿did you.? Did you have to sacrifice your personal life um, as a clinical pathologist and uh, whilst making all the, the research that you made that um, led you to, I mean, to, uh, to have this, uh, this Nobel Prize? I mean, it was a big sa uh, sacrifice for you um, to be very focused on, on medicine, on pathology, on, on your research on helicobacter as well as Uh, you to just uh, focus on that way rather than uh, improving your your life, your personal life, or with your family. So, uh, did you sacrifice your family in favor mm -hmm. of medicine? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. But actually, um, doing the res the res research work that I did with Helicobacter was just done as part of my day to day work anyway because I was just still looking at these things down the microscope. First of all, I just saw them as literally as part of the day-to-day -day work. Then I got some extra slides from the same, from all the cases of, gast of, of um, gastric biopsies and looked at them as a special series that I did. And I did those on my, in my own time at, in the evenings, which meant that I was a bit late home at night. Mm -hmm. Maybe my wife didn't like that, I don't know. But, but um, it r really didn't take up that much of my time. And What did your wife uh, think at that time of, of, of that well, day? Because so of your, your, whim, your wife uh, played a, a very significant role in, yeah, in support, giving, giving support to you. Just expand a little bit on that. Yeah, well, sometimes she complained I was late she home. She complained <laughs> a bit. <laughs> Because I was too late home, you know. But most of the time she understood. Uh, do, you, do you think that you have been able to... Um, uh, to achieve that discovery without, without her support? Well, I think I probably would have, but it would have been more difficult, yeah. She made it much easier. <laughs> she was a psychiatrist, wasn't she? Yeah. So maybe... Uh, she, she did do psychiatry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. she, she, uh, she probably understood things very well no? from a more a psychiatrist perspective of how things mm -hmm. work. Um, is it okay? The, the, the question answered. Eh, alguien como usted que pudo luchar contra todos los dogmas científicos del momento y contra la comunidad científica, ¿qué consejo le daría a alguien como yo, un alumno de tercero de medicina, para afrontar su carrera y el resto de su vida profesional? Gracias. The question is about um, overpassing difficulties when difficulties appear or barriers when they happen. And uh, he's on his uh, third year medical school. And the question is, what would you recommend him at the time of fighting against the say, the establishment or the, the current uh, paradigm or the beliefs about something in medicine or, or science? Because sometimes we are, we are very passionate when we are young, but, but when we get the specialty and years pass and pass and pass, maybe that passion goes down and maybe you are not Uh, very keen of uh, challenging the status quo at all, and you indeed mm -hmm. challenged the status quo somehow, not in a very violent way, for sure, but you did. So, yeah. what do you have to comment on, on overpassing that sort of resistance or resilience? Well, I don't think there's much point in challenging things if you haven't got anything to challenge. You really need to have something that you think is different from what other people say and, and that you're right. And uh, you make sure you're right first too. But um, so you know, I mean, I I found something which was out of place. It shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. So I had something to push. So I pushed it, 
and it didn't matter that I was middle-aged by that time. I wasn't young and passionate anymore. I didn't need that young passion because I had, I had something there to push. Yeah, but it was there, but n uh, nobody else did that. So you did it, but nobody else, and the, the bacteria was there. The, uh, yeah. and the elephant was in the room, wasn't it? Well, no one else seemed to see the elephant. It's, it's interesting. I mean, people knew that they weren't there, so they didn't see them. Expand a little bit on that. Why? <laughs> Why you? That w uh, you were an average medical student. Well, it's a very difficult thing to explain because I must admit, by that time, I had been particularly interested in gastric biopsies for about 10 years. And I'd been looking at lots of them very carefully. And I hadn't seen these bacteria there. But then, as I said, I wasn't looking or expecting them. And then one day I found them. And then once I found them, they were easy to see. And once I could see them and I started looking for them, you see them all the time. So, so I don't know why I didn't see them before. And I'm sure somebody else, and in fact I know in the end we found some old, you know, d um, a r a r some old uh, reports of them. Yeah. But um, they'd just been completely ignored. No one knew about them. And they were so completely ignored that when I tried to tell people that these bacteria were there, one of their main arguments against me was that, you know, if they really are there, Dr. Warren, why hasn't anyone described them before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how much anyone knew about any previous reports. And that was the main argument. In that was an argument to challenge your that challenged me, yeah. Yeah, for very first time. Yeah. And so what, what did you answer to that a stupid challenge? Well, I didn't know what the <laughs> answer was anyway, but and in the end, as I said, we did find a few reports on them in the past. Yeah. But the same sort of thing. I'm, I, we eventually found a, a, re a report by a, a Greek doctor. He didn't find bacteria there, but he, for some... I don't know how he did it either, but he, he actually found out that he could treat his ulcer patients with antibiotics. He didn't know why, <laughs> but he treated them with antibiotics and got good results. And um, in the end, I think he was pr practically outlawed from the profession for, <laughs> for uh, using incorrect medicine. At least in Greece, <laughs> he was using uh, antibiotics yeah. without any ev evidence. Yeah. So this is what uh, Fernando... E except that it worked, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the patients didn't mind. F Fernando is a great uh, supporter of uh, clinical experience within this uh, evidence-based medicine uh, concept, and uh, it truly goes that way. Of when yeah. one, one crazy guy in Greece was using antibiotics you know, to treat these sort of diseases without any, any evidence. Mm. And another interesting thing that sort of related to that was that uh, when Barry Marshall started treating these patients, he'd actually, just by chance, he'd read Osler's textbook of medicine on the subject, and you know, I mentioned this the other day that really it hasn't medicine hasn't changed all that much. And one of the treatments they used for ulcers was uh, bismuth. Bismuth, yeah. And they thought that bismuth probably worked by forming a coating on the surface of the ulcer so that it could heal underneath the coating. But Barry sort of thought, you know, I wonder if that actually has anything to do with the bacteria. Maybe it helps to get rid of them. So that was how his original triple therapy started, yes. using yeah. bismuth and a couple of antibiotics. Yeah. And it seemed to work very well. It does work very well, actually. Um, and we actually did a study of ulcers a few years later. We treated all these... We had a whole batch of ulcer patients. Barry was actually aiming at seeing what happened when you... Um, what, what happened to, to ulcer patients if you healed their ulcers with normal treatment for the ulcers... And some of them you got rid of the bacteria and some of them you didn't. And he wanted to find out what happened later on. And what we found out basically was that if you didn't get rid of the bacteria, the ulcers recurred. If you, almost always, actually. If you did get rid of the bacteria, the ulcers didn't recur. And it was a quite clear-cut thing. But... Um, the interesting thing about that was that these patients were given placebos or, mm -hmm. or, or some of them had full treatment f to get rid of the bacteria. Some of them were given just a plain placebo with no effect. But um, some of them, a, third, a quarter of them, were actually given just plain bismuth. 
And actually, that got rid of the bacteria in about 25% of the people with bismuth. Mm -hmm. Just bismuth. Bismuth. Yeah. So it is a, um, an, a, um, an anti, you know, bacterial killing material. It, you just take bismuth and it, in a quarter of those patients, it wiped out the bacteria. So I think old Ozla was onto something, but he didn't know what. <laughs> Ramon. Bueno, lo primero, perdón por no dirigirme a usted en inglés, y yo quería preguntarle eh, qué imagen tiene el resto del mundo de la medicina española y si ha mejorado en los últimos años o, o está empeorando. Well, this is a tricky question. Uh, Um, uh, do you have any sense of what's the opinion in in Australia about the medicine in Spain <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Spanish physicians? Do you have a, a, a let's say a, do we have a good reputation, a bad reputation, or basically we don't have any sort of reputation and <laughs> everything is bullfighting and paella and some sun? Yeah. Do you have any reference of of Spain in in Australia? Well, not really very much actually because we don't have a lot of contact with Spain um, uh, I mean I've had quite a lot of contact with Spain I've met a lot of people here but uh, by and large I mean there, there haven't been a lot of Spanish people come to Australia mm -hmm. so, I mean in, we've had a huge influx of people from all across northern Europe after the war and uh, also from Italy so there's a lot of Italian inf influence in Australia and In, um, we sort of know a lot about Italy, <laughs> but very few people know much about Spain. It's got something to do with South America, and that's about <laughs> it. Uh, so, no, I think by, by and large, I mean, I'm sure that there are more knowledgeable people than me working in universities and so on, and who do have a lot of uh, cross contact with yeah, people in Spain. Of but uh, it's not that widespread, and most people really wouldn't know much about it, I don't think. This is good. No It's news. taken for granted that Spanish medicine is quite good. I mean, you're, you're one of the better countries in Europe, and Europe's European medicine is, is really the tops. So. Yeah, I think it's good. <laughs> anyway, no news, good news. <laughs> I think, no? <laughs> Gracias. Sí, allí detrás. Uh, the first, thank you for your attention, Dr. Warren. And, well, I think my question is a little bit tricky, too. Uh, so, as you know, uh, since several years here in Spain, we've been uh, running through difficult economic times. And my question is, what would uh, a Nobel Prize say to those politicians who think that science, investigations, and education is not important and has not a uh, main, uh, uh, I don't know, a main... Uh, priority. Yeah, priority on on society. And how could we how could we as future scientists uh, make them see that they are totally wrong and science and investigation is the solution to that kind of situation? Thank you. Well, I think you've said it. It really is a solution to a lot of problems, and you can't really let up on on spending money on research and development. I mean, the whole country, like my country, has, has got to actually find new things to do as the old things fade out. At the moment, they're finding in Australia that a lot of um, industries are disappearing because they're getting too expensive and the, the companies are just can't go on. So... Uh, You know, a lot of that sort of thing is happening in Australia, so they're trying to do research and development type things to build other things up. When you, uh, when you conducted your research, uh, the resources that you had were huge or were very small resources? It were well, very scarce? Well, my research... I had almost no extra resources at all. No and resources? In fact, the only thing I actually ever needed was um, eventually when we started doing these studies with Barry Marshall, I had a huge number of results and I needed to be able to store them and so on. So actually I needed computer space to do that. Um, so I, I actually had, for fun, 
when they first came out in the late 1970s and bought myself a, an Apple II computer, yep. one of the very first ones that came out. And so I, at that stage I was fairly computer literate, which I'm not really much now, but, <laughs> but I was then. And so uh, I just had to get more storage space to, uh, to put my data into, and I was still using the old Apple II. And this was as we got into the 1980s. Um, and uh, I spent basically my own money on that. And Your own money? Yeah. I mean, I had to buy a, 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 a hard drive, I suppose you'd call it now, but mm -hmm. it was a thing about this big. Yeah, <laughs> I eventually found out it was something that universities use as a sort of storage thing for their, uh, you know, um, for the for the class. The database and, and all that stuff. Know, sort of database thing here yeah, that they, but this I mean remember this is back before PCs actually came in, and let alone mobile phones yeah. and so on. Nobody had that sort of thing, and I was one of very few people who had some sort of computer at all, and and uh, but to buy that storage thing which had about 64 kilobytes of <laughs> no it was a bit more than that it must have been well yeah it was 64 at that time maybe a megabyte case. or something like that not much mm -hmm. but I mean the computer itself had about 40 kilobytes of, of, of RAM in it and that's all you had to get this thing here which was I, I think it was 600 kilobytes actually 600 kilobytes and it was divided up into sections A, B, C, D, which were about 60 kilobytes each. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, that bloody thing cost me about $5,000 in you know, 1984 or something like that, which was worth, I mean, it's the equivalent now would be you know, $50,000 or something now. <laughs> so I, I spent all that on a bloody stupid thing then. <laughs> and th that was against your pocket, wasn't it? Yeah, but I mean, I, d I didn't try and get money from anyone else. And that was the only thing that cost any money at the time anyway, because I said I was doing it in, in a little bit, my laboratory using the uh, laboratory things, just doing the, by the standard day-to-day -day work. It really wasn't much more than that. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of an addition to the day-to-day -day work. So I didn't need a whole lot of uh, money coming in for me, but, but Barry did. He was doing a whole lot of extra stuff, and uh, <coughs> and he got more and more and more things that he was doing, and now he's running a whole laboratory with, you know, the whole floor of the hospital is his laboratory. So he's getting millions of dollars to do that. <laughs> he's a businessman. But yeah, he is. He he's actually is much more better. More I'm than not. you. Yeah. I, I'm not. I, are you, are you, I, I not never suggested you. I was, but, but Barry certainly is. <laughs> so, Miguel, did, did you get a point? I think uh, there is a, a very good learning here is that I fully agree with your point for obvious reasons uh, in my case, but at the end we have here an example of that this shouldn't uh, ever uh, be an excuse for not doing the right things and not doing things right. So as he got to, to, uh, to achieve that discovery that has changed r radically the, the life of millions of people, uh, without just a very few resources, even putting even putting money from his uh, from his pocket. So at the end, w I agree with your point, but sometimes so, uh, you just um, um, take advantage of that stupid situation of, of not having funds from the government or from whoever, and it is a great excuse in order to do like this. And uh, I'm not going to engage in hard research because of there are no resources, with very limited resources, with curiosity and with that passion and motivation of doing things of the bacteria uh, bacteria is there so okay let's go and let's find whatever we need rather than saying we cannot do anything because there is nothing I think it is a combination of both things fully agree with that point but also the learning of that okay and so what and so what let's find the other way it's not a matter of just crossing arms I think oh. we, we can speak about that <laughs> Okay, uh, more questions? Yeah, we have two. Uh, w well, it doesn't really matter. Are, are you okay with that? It's a, for efficiency reasons. Uh, Ariadna, then, uh, then it is uh, that guy there. Yeah, okay, after. Uh, no, Eduardo, Eduardo. Okay, hello, I'm Eduardo. Uh, we have talked uh, a lot about uh, bacteria, and I wonder, uh, meanwhile, you was in your, in your research, 
uh, did you make a test, uh, like a biopsy of your stomach, and you said, oh my god, uh, I have the bacteria? What? Did you uh, did you perform any tests? Uh, uh, what sort of test? Uh, at that time, it was just a biopsy. So, it, like a fakir uh, introducing a, a rigid endoscope. Any, any other test? Any, any other, other test? test. I, I don't think at that time there was any any available test. Uh, but Eduardo is, is asking about whether you, uh, uh, just for c curiosity purposes, that you you try to know in yourself or to, uh, to make a test in yourself in order to see whether you had uh, liquid. See whether I had them. Yes, but at that time and mm -hmm. uh, during your research. Or, or, or right now, after that, do you know whether you are a Helicobacter pylori, a positive? I hope I'm not positive now, but I was. You actually. okay? Um, I actually, um, after my wife found she was positive, I, I had myself tested, and I, I was positive too. I did a breath test. Mm -hmm. which was you did the breath test, yeah. Well, you know, the breath test was very early then, but it still yeah. worked. <laughs> it was very popular at the beginning. Yeah, but when then? Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, I, I actually was tested and then treated and tested again and was negative, so I hope I'm still negative. So uh, he uh, underwent the, the breath test, which you will learn something, something about that in, in, in the fourth year. Maybe you guys are already there. Even though now the, the diagnosis is more uh, the, the, the biopsy and then you know, the urease test and so on, but the breath test is also available, so he performed. That. Yeah, it's based on the fact that these bacteria produce a lot of enzyme called urease, which breaks down urea. So if you swallow some radioactive, well, it's not really radioactive, it's very slightly radioactive, perhaps, urea, with, um, I think it's carbon-14 or something, isn't it? Yes. Um, and if you've got the bacteria in your stomach, they break down the, ure the u urea, and then you breathe out that carbon dioxide from the urea, um, and you can measure the amount of that carbon, you know, that the carbon dioxide you breathe out, how much of it comes from the urea that you swallowed, and that tells you how many bacteria are in your stomach. Eh, bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, a ver, a quería ver. hacer dos preguntas. Bueno. Están relacionadas, vamos, tampoco son muy largas. Eh, la primera, a día de hoy en España por lo menos hay carreras como biología sanitaria o ingeniería biomédica que te permiten investigar el ámbito sanitario. Entonces, mi pregunta es si recomendaría a estudiantes que se quieran dedicar a la investigación estudiar medicina o esas carreras. Y también quería preguntar que, aparte de patología clínica, ¿hay otras especialidades dentro de la medicina que te permiten investigar? ¿Do you think it is of added value uh, to be a medical doctor? Uh, to, uh, let's say, devote more or less your entire life to biomedical research? Or you can just be a biologist or a biochemist, um, uh, a biochemist or biotech uh, technology or something like that. So, what is the added value of being a physician to engage in, in clinical research, since uh, or in biomedical research? I think it sort of widens your uh, your horizons a bit. But certainly, many of the great findings in medicine have been done by by non-medical graduate research workers, scientists. There's nothing wrong with being a scientist. But I don't think there's anything wrong with being a, a doctor either. And you can be both. Does it answer your question? And the second question was whether there are specialties. Besides pathology, there are other mm, specializations in medicine that could involve investigation such as histology or another one? The answer is yes. In any. I mean, in uh, every single specialty. Research is a transversal, it is a vocational thing. You just investigate in whatever the specialty is. So 360 spectrum. Whatever the specialty you choose, you can build research on that. Quería preguntarle que cómo se siente un médico al ser consciente de que gracias a su trabajo ha podido cambiar la vida de tantas personas en el mundo. 
Um, are you conscious about the, the the huge impact that you? I mean, how do you feel when you when you truly know, or even that patients could come to you and and tell you? In fact, I I was uh, I was a witness yesterday of uh, I think it was even one medi of our medical students or another guy just saying to you, thank you, sir, because yeah. of thanks to your research, my fam or my relative or even yeah. myself. How do you feel at that time? Uh, it makes me feel good. Yeah, and it's quite common actually. A lot of people do. It say is that. quite common. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of surprised me how common it is actually. Yeah. Even now, when we've got such powerful drugs which can actually heal the bug, the the, the ulcers, but they don't get rid of the bugs, and the ulcers can come back again. Sí. Eh, usted ha hablado antes de de los, no, médicos, no micro de los médicos en España y eso, yo le voy a preguntar eh, en su biografía el premio Nobel Severo Ochoa dijo que él jamás hubiera obtenido ningún logro ni hubiera conseguido allá los hallazgos que hizo si no fuera por su esposa entonces yo le quiero preguntar qué papel tuvo su esposa a la hora de sus investigaciones y si usted cree que si la ayuda de su esposa hubiera podido conseguir los logros que consiguió Gracias. Well, it, it, the question it, it links to um, uh, keep quiet, guys. Uh, links to um, uh, one point that we already covered, or more or less covered, a few minutes ago about what is the role of the um, of the partner of the researcher. In your case, it, it was your uh, your wife. My wife. Okay. Yeah. In other cases, if the researcher is a, is a woman, it would be well the couple or the partner or whatever. So. What do you think it is the is the true role of the partner in uh, in supporting the the researcher? Well, it's nice to have a supporting partner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is this is by default. But yeah. just imagine that 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 when she I mean she she didn't like at all anything what you were doing or your sacrifice of just arriving home quite late in the evening and say, hey, Robin. John Robin Warren, for sure, she, uh, <laughs> she should call it like you, like this, and you say, I don't want this, so I'm not going to support you. Well, she didn't, but actually there were times when she wasn't too happy. <laughs> 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 and actually, uh, I'd make another comment about that, talking about doctors and other researchers yeah. doing it. I think it depends to some extent the sort of research that you're doing. Um, the very basic things, like basic biology and biochemistry and so on, are perhaps done more easily by biochemists and, and um, basic biologists. So the really fundamental things, perhaps uh, done perfectly well and probably better by people like that. Whereas when you get up towards more clinical things, dealing with people, it, I think it's definitely better done with a, someone with medical knowledge mm -hmm. uh, in between. You know, it doesn't really matter much. You could be both. But there's nothing. No, I mean doctors are actually taught to be um, um, scientists anyway. I think a lot of people do what. I mean, I don't know what you do here, but um, a lot of, of universities in Australia they take a year off to do um, bachelor of medical science on the way through. Mm -hmm. that, that was, uh, uh, did you get it? Uh, Hi, my name is Fernando, and my question. And my question is, how did you survive to the criticism of all your colleagues, all the doctors, when you had already known about the existence of helicobacter pylori and anyone believed you? How did I survive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a survivor of the... Uh, <coughs> The, the, the owners of the paradigm at that time, it was more a matter of uh, how, how long did it, did it take uh, for the scientific community to accept uh, your findings? I think it, qui it took quite long, isn't it? Yeah, they certainly didn't when we actually first published our work. And, that, and even the people that I was working with, uh, even in my own laboratory, that, that they didn't really think it was of, it of any great interest at that stage. Even Barry Marshall at the beginning. Even oh, Barry Marshall, yeah. He even didn't Barry Marshall at the beginning. He just kept on sending he, and sending specimens to me, and eventually, he did suddenly become quite interested. And yeah. once he became interested, there was no stopping him. <laughs> but no, the, the other people weren't interested um, either before I met Barry, or particularly, or even afterwards. 
Um, but as I said before, it didn't worry me particularly because I knew I was right. Because <laughs> I had such strong evidence, you know, for what I was saying. And when I met Barry, we had even stronger evidence. But still people didn't believe it. Well, it didn't, you know, I couldn't see the, what the worry was, you know. I mean, it didn't worry me that they didn't believe it because I knew I was right. So basically you didn't care yeah. much, just straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Are you very stubborn? Obstinated? I don't think I am actually, but people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I s some, some people at the time. He is. <laughs> he, he looks like, yeah. A bit, but just a bit. Just a bit. I don't think he wouldn't have succeeded at all unless he were stubborn. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yo quería preguntarle si cree que su descubrimiento ha sido un punto de inflexión en cuanto a la comunidad médica de ser un poco más abierto de miras o que seguimos anclados a unos paradigmas muy rígidos. Que si realmente ha supuesto, hemos bueno, si se ha aprendido algo de, de este descubrimiento o si es posible que ahora mismo esté habiendo descubrimientos iguales y que se estén bloqueando por las mismas razones. La pregunta es sobre whether you think that the impact, uh, not just in the population on patients, but on the scientific community about your discovery uh, and uh, about your case of which the, uh, the, the blue elephant was in the room and nobody saw it, and maybe they didn't see it because of they simply just uh, digest everything and they believe everything. And this trend is that sometimes we observe in science of that we do not question all the things that we should be questioning, even though the evidence is there. So it is like, well, you know, yeah. this guy through um, uh, questioning something that was quite obvious instead of just remaining on your, let's say, comfort area or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that truly you, I mean, you, you achieved uh, such, a big, uh, su such a big step. So do you think the scientific community is aware of that we should be? Uh, just challenging things if the evidence is there rather than just uh, well if try t uh, trying to find any other excuse to explain the findings within the current paradigm you have to find the evidence to start with yeah you can't just sort of try and say everything's wrong with no evidence for it I mean, we had evidence but people still didn't like the idea um, but I mean I'm sure there are lots of things in medicine that um, are not right that we're taught you know, take it for granted but it, I mean I think it's difficult for doctors because you can't just suddenly start tra you know, doing things differently because someone down there says something <laughs> like I did you know mm -hmm. I mean I can understand the, um, the general um, medical field not suddenly all, all starting treating their patients differently because cause I found some bacteria in the stomach because it wouldn't be good medicine to do that mm -hmm. would it You've got to, it's got to actually be proved. But at the same time, it, one interesting thing that happened to us was that when our work was first published and the official publication of it, it was, re it, it, it was uh, republished actually um, in the uh, New York Times and it covered the front page of the science section in the New York Times and also uh, I think it covered page two or something like that in, you know, in that it's whole section of the New York Times. They were really keen on it. And from that it spread, you know, like Twitter does these days, it spread around the world and all the newspapers around the world, around, around Australia anyway, published the stuff that we'd put in the, in the Lancet. And it appeared in the New York Times. Some of the Australian newspapers actually just reproduced the New York Times stuff, which was very well done. It's, if you can get New York Times, it's worth having a look at actually. <laughs> Do you think it was a milestone for your discovery that mm -hmm. you uh, it, that this fact that the New York Times uh, published the same information that was already published in a scientific journal that yeah. this let's say changed everything and that your uh, the knowledge was spread and uh, well I think it made things easier for us you know I'm I'm really glad they did publish it like that because it <laughs> what it did was that it got it in the newspapers around the world and suddenly patients were going to see their GPs with this letter, you know, this article, and saying, look, these findings of, you know, a way of treating ulcers, 
And these poor buggers did had you know they had terrible bloody pain in their stomach, no way of treating it. <laughs> and they were demanding to be treated by their GPs, not the specialists. You know they were up here not taking any notice of it. But they're going to their GPs. The GPs sent letters to us and asked us how how they could treat them. So we actually, in the end, we just had printed things with all the, the, the methods that they could use, sent these out to the GPs. And there are a whole lot of GPs, particularly around Perth, who were treating, because I mean, there were in Sydney as well, I know too, um, and probably in other places, but you know, I particularly know the ones in, Sydney, in Perth. They were treating these patients with excellent results. They were all very happy about it. The patients were happy, the GPs were happy, and meanwhile, the, the uh, the specialists up here were, you know, not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I think that they, they were so not very happy. So actually, the, before it was recognised by the medical world, it was recognised by lots of GPs. And, you know, I mean, I can understand it because the poor old GPs got this is stuff in the newspaper and the patient wants to be treated mm -hmm. and they can get this information from us, and which makes it look pretty good. <laughs> I think so they were doing it and they were getting good results. So the GPs were happy, the patients were happy. <laughs> I think this is a good example of, uh, in, in medicine, sometimes we think that uh, things happen in a, in a top-down manner, so as the super top specialists mm -hmm. are the guys who influence the rest of the world. This means the, 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 the primary care physicians or the GPs, and then influence the, the population. But this is a, a, a clear case of a bottom-up uh, rather than a top-down approach in which the mass media just uh, w uh, making the population aware of this and this is the, the real power of patients and society. Mm. Patients go into the, the GPs and then the GPs are, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on and just looking up and telling the specialists, hey guys, what's going on? Because uh, we, we have a demand here uh, right down. Mm. So uh, sometimes it is uh, more powerful a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down, and at the end we will need to be ready for that. And this is, a, at the end, a patient-centered medicine. The patient's just saying, okay, what's going on? I need a, I need a, a result. Yeah. Well, it's a painful disease Indeed when they've got is. ulcers, and the patients were demanding to be treated. Yeah. So actually a lot of the GPs were prepared to go on and treat them. Yeah, <laughs> because our patients should push us, yeah. don't they? My name is Mariana, and I was wondering, uh, did all the achievements you've made uh, through your life make you happier? I mean, are you, are you happier right now after all the Nobel Prize, the uh, Helicobacter pylori and everything? Or how, how do you feel? If you're happier now uh, compared to before? Yeah, I mean, uh, after all nominated. the hard work and the researchers and everything. Do you think um, um, you're happier now than before uh, receiving the, the Nobel Prize? Just imagine that you, you don't... Shut up! I wouldn't exactly on. say I was happier, but I'm pleased about it. You're pleased, but not necessarily happier. I was happy then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just imagine that, uh, that you discover... Uh, well, this is the case maybe of the, the vast majority of the guys that are sitting down here, that we might uh, make a lot of discoveries and nobody's going to, um, to award us with the Nobel Prize. So, how would you, how would you feel if it just uh, you you don't receive such an award, but your results are there and the population mm. has this sort of benefit, but you are not acknowledged in that way by scientific community? Not well. I don't think. It, I mean, I. It was nice to be acknowledged like that. I didn't really expect it. To tell you the truth, I was a bit surprised when we got the, the um, you know, when it was announced. Um, I certainly don't mind getting the Nobel Prize. The, and the, uh, and receiving the Nobel Prize has changed anything in your life? Well, the main way it's changed things is that I get invited all the time to meetings like this. And, and for one week, <laughs> for an exhausting week. <laughs> yeah. And oh, at my age, they're a bit like hard work, actually, going travelling around the world. Because remember, I come from Australia. If I was living in Europe, I could go to all the cities in Europe without much trouble, but... Mm -hmm. But it's a long way from Australia. It is a long way. Okay. Um, I think this is the last question. So thank you very much, Robin, for your answers. I, I've loved this, uh, this dialogue, to be honest. Mm -hmm. No, not anymore. I'm very sorry, guys. 
Uh, we will have just uh, a, a few, uh, after we finish, uh, you will have the opportunity to, to engage with, uh, with Robin in a more in a face-to-face -face manner. Not for a um, very long time anyway, so uh, be ready for that. But I think it's been, uh, it's been a very nice dialogue, so congratulations, guys. I'm, I'm very proud of you indeed. So I think it's very, very, very positive and of, of added value yeah, indeed. Uh, thank Antes you very much, sir, for... Yeah. Antes de quietos, quietos, quietos. Esperar, esperar. Un momentito. Conteneos. Me quería despedir yo. Bueno, este hombre ha hecho muchas cosas. Lo tenéis aquí delante y... No sé, ¿veis a, ¿veis a Superman? ¿Os parece alguien que ha hecho algo heroico desde la fortaleza de espíritu, desde un arrojo, no sé? A mí me parece un hombre frágil. Normal, un estudiante medio, o sea que Virginia puede ser perfectamente el premio Nobel del 2040 después de que yo sea el 27. <risa> Estaba ya pensando en mi discurso, así que ya te daré ideas de aceptación. Lo digo porque se puede, se puede hacer cosas como estas que han sido muchas. Ha hecho muchas cosas mmm, por vosotros también. Os ha quitado una semana de clases, no sé si sabéis. En mi época se estudiaba una semana de cirugía de la úlcera de estómago. Era un rollo, con varias intervenciones, algunas eran de amputar, de cortar un nervio, de hacer una serie de cosas, y nos metían en un rollo los cirujanos que hoy, por fortuna, nos estudian, ¿no? Así que disfrutarlo, eh, ese menos estudio que tenéis, y disfrutar de lo que vuestros pacientes tendrán. Eh, en épocas muy recientes todavía convertíamos a los pacientes en crónicos, les dábamos de por vida medicación, les prohibíamos el tabaco, el alcohol, les decíamos que tenían que hacer una dieta con verdura cocida durante toda la vida, en fin, era una amargura. Y hoy, en una consulta donde un paciente suena que tiene mucho tiempo un dolor de estómago, se hace un test de aliento, barato, accesible en todos sitios, se sospecha... Eh, la infección y se trata y en 15 días el problema se olvida he vivido casos dramáticos eh, mi primera guardia de residente la compartí con otro residente que tuvo una hemorragia digestiva en directo y fue directamente a la UCI un chaval pues, de 22 años internista que no sabía nada de esto y que tuvo aquel problema mi padre con 89 años un fin de semana que fui a verle le vi pálido como la pared y tenía una hemoglobina de 6 acabamos en el hospital también ingresado y curado en 15 días, hoy, seguramente hace poco tiempo atrás, pues hubiera fallecido. Así que eh, saquemos la moraleja de que se puede investigar desde la sencillez y desde la normalidad total, si uno es inquieto, si uno tiene preguntas que hacerse y no las deja pasar. Surgirán durante el estudio, surgirán durante la práctica clínica, cosas que no entendéis, dudas que os parecen que no tienen explicación, uno las puede aparcar o puede apuntarse al carro de Robin Warren, que es el que se plantea respuestas. ¿no? Así que me planteaba ya ahora qué pensaré cuando en el 27 me den el Nobel y cuando me jubile y tenga 78, ¿cuántos tiene? 79 años, me inviten a ir a dar una charlita, una semana de conferencias así, coñazo, a Perth, Australia, a una facultad que está empezando con gente muy maja, que me van a llevar y a través del hotel cada cinco minutos y a lo mejor me escaqueo, seguramente diré que no. Así que le vamos a dar un aplauso ahora así grande, grande, porque se lo merece. Okay, now we have a surprise for for Robin. It's not a uh, <laughs> it's not a surprise for you guys, but for Robin, I think it will. Or maybe it is a surprise for them as well. Uh, so uh, stay there. La, uh, la, the Spartans band uh, va a hacer una super performance. I <laughs> uh, hope you will enjoy it. Uh, y que nadie se vaya.